So today's talk is called um, But God, and um, there's been a lot of big changes in my life, and so God pressed this on my heart of what but God means and what a but God moment is, and, and we'll get into that a little bit, but because um, there's just been thing, big things that I've just had to walk through, and they sound crazy, but then I have to remember, but God, God is bigger than all those things. And so as I was going through this, is that, is that me? Sound like a beating of a bongo. So it's just amazing how different a sentence or a statement can mean with just a change of punctuation. To show, I, I really want to look at this funny picture, and we probably have seen it online. Some of us haven't if you're not on social media. But let's take a look at this statement. <clears throat> let's eat grandma. Innocent, right? It means grandma, let's go get some grub. We're going to go to the store, we're going to get some grub. Change the punctuation, and the sentence becomes, let's eat grandma. <laughs> completely different. One of them is appropriate, the other one is not. It's a completely different meaning, and all that was changed was a comma. That was it. Completely different. Or what about the statement that it's what you said? It's not what you said, it's how you said it, right? You know, when your arms are crossed, but you're saying, no, I'm fine, but you have a chip on your shoulder. Husbands, you know what I'm talking about. When your wife is like, I'm fine. No, she ain't. You better take care of that before you go to bed. So it's not what you said, but it's how you said it. And the same thing with the punctuation. There's a difference in statements and sayings. And so... <clears throat> When you say it, it's, it's taken differently because your words and your face are saying something different. So for today's talk, we're going to visit the statement, but God, and really kind of dissect and look into the statement is very different with the punctuation used. But before we get into that, let's talk about what a what or but God moment is. It's those storms in our life that God brings us through. God has to intervene in some way. Or those big promises in life that only can be done with God. It's those crazy, impossible moments. There's no other explanation but God. And to further drive this home, let's take a, a look at a few scriptures. So in Acts 7, 9 through 10, because the patriarchs were jealous of Joseph, they settled him as a slave into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him from all his troubles. Did you see that? But God was with him and rescued him. Joseph could have been killed, but God happened. And this was, he was brought into the role because God can use him. He became the second most powerful person in the world at that time. It's absolutely amazing. Let's take a look at 1 Samuel 23. David stayed in the desert strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. Saul could have killed David, but God happened, and he was saved. He became a great king for his people and did some really awesome things. He was even called a man after God's own heart. Let's take a look at Acts 3.14. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the meant for evil was thwarted by a but God moment. And to me, this is the but God moment of all the but God moments. This is a changing point for us. This is the moment that Jesus defeated death, the enemy is defeated, and the battle has been won. There's no more fighting. It's been done. And because of it today, we are set free of sin because of his death and resurrection, because of a but God moment. And I am so thankful for those moments. And in all of these examples, it could have been done, it could have been finished, but God intervened. And that's what a but God moment is. So when you see a, a but in a sentence, it's those moments that God throws down an uno reverse card 
and he flips the story around. He changes the script. It becomes completely something different to glorify him, to glorify his kingdom, to show his power, to show his love for us. So we talked about punctuation and differences there. So I want to take a look at but God with a question mark. We can say but God, but we kind of have a question mark at the end of it. We're kind of questioning what's happening. And it's a question. It's like dipping your toe in. It's okay to have a little faith. It's okay to dip your toe in sometimes. And we start our walk not as faith giants. We start with simple and humble beginnings. We start with baby steps and small faith. And so if we remember what Jesus said, if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, it might be small, but it is mighty. We just need small faith. And don't underestimate that smallness. It's huge. It's going to glorify God. Don't hold it back. And it can absolutely be a difficult place when we're in the but God question mark, right? Because the enemy will try and get us to question God and to doubt God. Did God really say? I think I remember that somewhere in the Bible. Doubt is always in conflict with faith. And if the enemy can get us to doubt, he can get us to lose faith. It's okay that we have doubt. It happens. But you continue to lean towards faith, believing in God, and getting away from a but God question to but God, man, mighty things can happen. The next one to look at is but God exclamation point. This is one that's said with excitement and joy. We may not know what's up the road, but we push forward with joy, enthusiasm, and love, and it can carry us absolutely far. And when I thought about this one, I thought about a man named Todd White. If you ever heard him, about him or seen him, and you've ever heard his story, it's absolutely amazing when you listen to him. He read the Bible when he was saved, and he was saved after he got shot. He was dealing drugs. I mean, this guy was rough. And he saw healing in the Bible. And he, he goes, if Jesus is true, so is this. And he pressed full-heartedly into it. And he will tell you that he prayed for 1,000 people before he saw his first healing. You know what carried him through? But God enthusiasm. Because if you listen to Todd White, he is probably the most happy-go-lucky, joyful guy I've ever heard in my life. That joy, that enthusiasm is infectious. You, you, you just want to listen. You want to embrace. You want to hear what he has to say because of that, that excitement, that joy. Sometimes the enthusiasm is the only thing that's pushing us through. Lord, I know it's in your word. I'm going to be joyful as I do it. This situation might stink, but I'm going to do it with joy. I'm going to be happy. I'm going to be excited but God, but God is bigger than this. And just continue to push forward. And then finally, we have but God, period. This one, to me, is more of a matter of fact. It's done, it's settled, it's unshakable, it's unmovable. We kind of go through the course because we might have questions, then we have enthusiasm, but then there's a point where it's settled. You are not shaken, you are not stirred up, Nothing is moving you from that point of, but my God is bigger. My God is bigger, better. My God, it's okay. I don't care what you throw at me because it's settled in my spirit. And when I thought about this one, I thought about David and Goliath. David, a young boy, was the only one that would stand up to Goliath because his faith in God was strong. Trained warriors were stepping down because they were afraid of the intimidating stature of Goliath. So let's take a look at what David said in 1 Samuel 17, 45. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied today. The Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. Woohoo! Goliath was a big dude. He had weapons. David wasn't. But you know what? David in there knew God. He had a but God moment. And so did you see that but God moment in there? 
It was a matter of fact. And I love how David says, yep, I see the reality. You got swords, you got weapons, you're bigger than me. It don't matter because, but my God is greater. I come in the name of my God. And then what he does, David calls the shots. He doesn't let the situation dictate. He calls a shot and he says, and I'm going to kill you. And not only am I going to kill you, I'm going to take your head. And I'm going to be ready for your brothers. But he was calling the shots. And so when we know who we are in Christ and that Christ is in us, we become matter of fact with our faith. We stand firm. We dig our heels in. And so as we kind of unpackage this, I really want to dive in. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on Joseph for the rest of the evening. And, uh, you know, it's funny, as I, was, it was, as I was working on this sermon, I had a whole different vision of where I was going to go. And then Tuesday, God's like, go read about Joseph. Okay, <laughs> we're going to change gears here. So we re- we're going to take a look at the Joseph. And so to start to understand Joseph, Joseph was highly favored by his father Jacob. This made his brothers very jealous and very envious, right? Because normally it was the firstborn that got the favor. It was the firstborn that kind of got everything, especially the firstborn boy. That wasn't, that wasn't Joseph's case. Joseph got favor, and his dad did not hide it. He did not hide this from the family. So Joseph, as growing up, he has two dreams. And in these dreams, they're interpreted to be his brothers and parents would be bowing down to him. His family was super upset about this. They actually rebuked him. They got angry with him. They got frustrated with him. Why would they, the younger, the brother, the parents, why would they bow down to them? They, they couldn't understand it. So, so they're rebuking him. They're upset with him. His brothers then find an opportunity to get rid of him because if, if we can get the favorite out of the picture, maybe our dad will love us or our situation will change a little bit. So they saw an opportunity and they seized it to get rid of him. They sold Joseph into slavery and told their father Jacob that he was killed by an animal. So now Jacob believes that his son is gone forever when they really sold him into slavery. And it's really hard to see the but God moments in here. It sounds terrible, like you're favored by your dad, your brothers hate you, they want to kill you, but they don't kill you, they throw you in a hole, then they take you out of the hole and they sell you. I don't know about you, my brothers have done some messed up stuff to me. They ain't do that. His family resented him so much. So how can this be a butt guide story? So the story continues, and the slavers sold Joseph to Potiphar in Egypt. This is where we'll pick up Genesis 39 too. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. That was Potiphar. So now we start to see the moments. Joseph is blessed. And what he puts his hands to is blessed. So God was with him, and it shows. So he gained favor from those that were around him because they benefited from Joseph's favor. So they put him in charge of it. It's like, if he's this favored at anything he does... Put them in charge of it, all of it. Because they know whatever his hands were on was blessed. There was favor on that. These are non-godly people. And they saw the favor. They saw the outpowering. So this is where God is working. But as we know, the story turns. Potiphar's wife wants Joseph. But he continues to deny her. Continues to avoid her. Until one day she traps him. And then lies. And then takes advantage of the situation and says Joseph took advantage of her. So Joseph was arrested and thrown into prison. How is prison a but God moment? Here he is, sold into slavery. He's now serving in an Egyptian's house. He gets accused of rape and he gets put in prison. John, you're not really telling a good story here. This sounds terrible. This sounds horrible. But often... 
we can miss those but God moments or how God is using us because of our current situation. He uses our current situation for something greater. He can use our current situations to glorify him. I'm not saying God causes these situations to happen, but God can use them. Absolutely he can. Moments and emotions are fleeting, but God is everlasting. So we need to focus on God and not the situations, looking to him for our next steps to take. So here's Joseph in prison, and we see another but God moment. Genesis 39, 21. But the Lord was with Joseph. You see that? Right away. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Mm. So he had that favor in the Egyptian's house. He has that favor in prison. I don't know about you all, but I'm pretty sure when you're in prison, they ain't putting you in charge of nothing. Maybe you can cook a meal or work the line or do something like that, but they ain't putting you in charge of everything to the point where this guy did not worry about a thing that he didn't even check up on him because he knew he was an honorable man and he knew he had the favor of God, so he allowed him to work in that favor. So again, we see God working here and those around Joseph are being blessed because of the favor he carries. Some time passes, two servants of Pharaoh are imprisoned and they have dreams. Talked about dreams earlier. We're going to talk about dreams again. Genesis 48. And they said to him, we each have had a dream and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Even in the thick of it, Joseph is pointing back to God. I don't know. I can tolerate a lot of things, but what Joseph has gone through so far, I'd probably be grumbling a little bit. I'd probably be frustrated a little bit. I'm not going to say because I haven't been through it, but would I, be, would I be pointing back to God and be like, well, God can tell you. Tell me and I'll help you. I, I don't know. I'm, I might be a little bitter. I might be a little angry. I might be a little frustrated. But in the thick of it, he understands where his blessing and favor come from. It's not from him. It's not his hard work. It's from God, and he knows that. And so he leans into what God has already given him, but he doesn't take the credit. He understands, and he sees the but God moments. Instead of the moment just happening to him this time, like they have in the past, he's navigating it. He starts to take control. He goes, aren't they gods to interpret? But go ahead and tell me. Because he knows that God is going to use him. So he starts to take control. Very different than what happened before. So Joseph interprets the dream exactly. The cupbearer is restored to his position. And the baker was impaled. Not something that you can just probably guess. I'm like, yeah, you're going to be restored to your position and then you're going to die. He didn't just guess that. He got that wisdom. He got that revelation. He got that knowledge from God. God gave Joseph that wisdom. So as some time passes, Joseph is still in prison. Pharaoh has a dream. Now this is probably the most powerful man on earth at the time. Is Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has a dream that no one can interpret. And the cupbearer remembers what Joseph did for him. And he tells Pharaoh... And then Joseph is brought to Pharaoh. He's pulled out of prison. He's brought to Pharaoh. And I love what Joseph does because he has the same response as he did to the cupbearer, as he did for the baker, as he does for Pharaoh. He says, it's not me, but God. So Genesis 41, 16. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Hmm. I'm just like in awe of this because how many times do we shy away? Here is an ungodly man, doesn't believe in the same God, and Joseph's being pulled out of prison, standing in front of the Pharaoh, and he's talking about God. 
He's got some guts. He's giving glory back to God. He continues to point the finger to God. He could easily, because he's done it several times now, been like, oh, I'll, I'll do that for you to try and gain favor. But he doesn't do that. He continues to point to God. So Joseph gives Pharaoh the interpretation of the dream. And really, just long story short, the dream means there's going to be seven years of prosperity followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph tells Pharaoh, Genesis 41, 28, this is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. God is showing the future so they can react, so they can take action, so they can prepare. It makes me think about it, though, in a different aspect. What if they ignored God and they ignored this but God moment and chalked it up as a nightmare or nonsense? He could, Pharaoh could have easily been like, you know what, go back to jail. I ain't listening to that. You know, we haven't had this happen. We're going to be okay. So we see this God moment, and it's a huge, huge turning point in Joseph's life and for future generations. Genesis 41, 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch, inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Whoo! Favor, favor, favor. He was favor as a slave. He had favor in the prison. And now he has favor with Pharaoh. This is a non-Egyptian man a Hebrew who, guess what, becomes the second most powerful person to an Egyptian. He actually makes all the calls. He, Pharaoh's saying, look, it's just the throne that divides us. You're in control. I'm going to sit up here and look pretty. That's the way I read it. But what looked like a bad to worse story now has changed. In just a quick but God moment. And so all these but God moments were leading up and there was time in between, years in between. And Joseph could have lost faith, but he didn't. He stayed true to God and those but God moments start to add up. They add up. And now you start to see the storyline come to fruition. You start to see things happening. Joseph's now the second most powerful person on the planet for the time. And again, because of the favor on his life, those around him benefited a society that believes in gods and goddesses and not the one true God partook of the blessing because of their proximity to the man of God. They were blessed and used by God through a series of but God moments because those around Joseph saw the favor and brought him closer. They didn't push him away. They didn't try and kill him. They're like, there's something different here. And this different is good. They brought him closer because they knew the closer he got, the more blessed they were. They had a good thing going for him. So what was on Joseph was shared with all those around him. And this makes me think about our faith life. Are those around us blessed because of the outpouring of favor in our life? Mm. To me, what God gives me, I want to give it to everybody else. I don't want to keep it. He, he, he's working to get it through. You just keep giving it freely, and then we keep pointing up. It's not, not me, not, not I, not us, but God. You just, it just keep, keep it going. You know, the example I like to use with that is like a humidifier. You pour water in a humidifier, and you run it so it diffuses the atmosphere. This little device takes water from this point and changes the air. It makes it more humid. It makes it easier to breathe, whatever you want to say. But I had a humidifier that I left for like two weeks. I didn't turn it on. Humidifiers are not meant to hold water. So guess what happened? It leaked. It's not, it's, it's not a bowl. It's not a container. It's supposed to change the atmosphere. I'm supposed to run. I fill it up and I run it. 
That's what we should be doing, going to God, getting, and giving. Get, give, get, give. Just, it just, it's a never-ending cycle. But a lot of times, it stops one way. We get, and then we go. We need to get and give. So let's talk about Joseph some more. And I love Joseph. I, I don't know how many times I've read uh, this part of Genesis. Um, but I, it's funny, though, because the other day when I was reading it again, and I just started crying. I just started, like, just tears coming down my face because when you look at it from this perspective, man, we got an awesome God. I mean, I'm, I was just, like, taken back, like, what God has done in not just countless lives, but all of our lives. It's just absolutely crazy. So Joseph's not only elevated to a position, he was given a wife and began to create a family there. Genesis 41, 51. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. That's a pretty strong name. All of this horrible things that happened to Joseph, and here's what he calls his firstborn son. He's not even thinking and living in the back and the past. He's just seeing all the but God and the blessing and the favor and the provision that God has given him that he's forgotten it all. We got to let some of that go. We absolutely do. And it continues on and says, in the name of the second, he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So he's not numb, he's not naive to what's happened to him. Sometimes we forget that forgiveness isn't forgetfulness. Two different things. (laughs) You can still remember and forgive. And so here he is, as he's being fruitful in what was meant to be a punishment by his brothers or to get rid of him or to live a life in turmoil, God has made him fruitful. And not just for himself, but all those around him. The hardship in Joseph's life, they're just not lost. They're not ignored. They're not pretended to not be there. It was a choice by Joseph, and he chose to continue to honor and glorify God in all he did, and he was blessed in return. So now the story, the seven years of prosperity have passed. They've been storing up all the excess, all the extra, because they know what's coming. The rest of the world doesn't really know. But they do because they were being used by God. So they're storing this all up. But because of God's blessing and wisdom given to Joseph and all the but God moments and that he was perfectly placed where God needed him, Egypt was saved. They stored during that time of prosperity to sustain and flourish them in times of famine. They got very wealthy during that time because they were able to sell food to other areas that didn't have it. And so finances were coming in. The famine reached far and even to the land of his family. So his family hears of Egypt selling food, so they set out to Egypt to buy some. And here's what happens when his brothers come face to face with Joseph. For the first time in years after selling him, they don't recognize him. So Genesis 42, 6. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed about. And if you recall from the beginning... The dreams that Joseph was rebuked about, he was given a hard time about, his family bowing down to him, they happened. They came to fruition. What didn't seem like a but God moment in the beginning shows up now as a but God moment. Sometimes we got to go back and see those moments. We might not see it in the, the thick and the thin of it, but then it's like we get down 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road and go, That was you. (laughs) 
man, sometimes we got to journal some of these things so we remember because we forget easily. You kind of look back and go, you, you were at the head of this from the start. So this, is, this isn't a mistake. This isn't just like on a whim. You were with me at the beginning. Man, and that's just absolutely crazy. So Joseph sold into slavery, put into prison, risen to second in command. Now his brothers are bowing down to him. As he still plays with them a little bit. He doesn't let them know right away. Joseph messes with his brothers. They still don't recognize him for a while. I mean, he's still a brother. I mean, if you got brothers and sisters, you, you, you mess with them. He, he saw an opportunity. He's like, I'm going to play this up a little bit. I'm going to make them sweat. Sell me into slavery. No, I'm just kidding. That's me. <laughs> so he messes with them a little bit, but then finally Joseph breaks. He reveals his true identity to his brothers, and he says this to them. I don't know. If my brothers did this to me, I, I don't know if I could respond like Joseph did. He goes, hey, I'm your brother, the one you sold into slavery. You know, kind of like how many other brothers they got. You know, the one you sold into slavery, that's the one I am. So Genesis 45, 5. But don't be upset. And don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh, very unique choice of words there, father to Pharaoh, and Lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout the land of Egypt. I love it. Joseph is going, look, this thing you did to me, but God. He consoles them a little bit for the evil they committed against him, and continues to point out the good, that God's goodness and how he made it all for the good of many. He could have taken whatever road and probably been justified. The Pharaoh would have been like, I would have done that too, man. They did some terrible things to you. We're thankful because you came to us, helped us out in a pinch. But he doesn't do that. He continues to glorify God in that. I mean, just think about that. How many years in prison, how many years in slavery he could have been festering on that, being negative and having a horrible thought life, thinking about the day I see him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, buddy, it's on. He doesn't do that. He loves him. He cares for him. He consoles him and says, but God. But God. Don't you worry about that. But God was at the head of this. But God was right there since the beginning. When there seems to be no options, no way out, terrible thing after terrible thing, God was with them, and he showed what the meaning of but God means. As we come to the end of this, there's continued blessing and God taking care of all of them. Genesis 47, 5. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen, and if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. I love that last sentence. Pharaoh ain't dumb. He goes, look, if I got one that the favor's on and the blessing, you got some more? Because <laughs> I'm going to put them in charge of other things. I'm, I'm, this is a good thing going for me. He doesn't give, Pharaoh doesn't give him the scraps. He doesn't give them what's left over and says, my people are going to have the best. You go to that land where it smells like do dookie. <laughs> I was trying to find the church-appropriate word to say. <laughs> he gives them the best. And, he's, and he, he says, all that stuff that you have at your house is garbage. Leave it. Because I'm going to give you the best of what Egypt has to offer. He absolutely gives them the blessing. So, from the beginning, God orchestrated this, and through all these but God moments, we see God save lots of people. His redemptive story here is absolutely huge. The family didn't deserve it, but God. But God was at the head of all of it. So I think about Joseph 
being discarded by his family, sold into slavery, sent to prison, becomes second in command to save his life and his people. And the story of Joseph truly shows that no matter the circumstances, no matter the giants, no matter the mountains, there is nothing too impossible for God. We need to adopt a but God attitude in our lives. And when life is coming down on us, the report from the doctor, it's not good. The bills are stacking up. Our addictions have a hold on us. No matter what it is, we need to stand up in the face and say, but God. It may be shaky. It may be a question. We might be excited with a little wheeze at the end like, oh. Or maybe we're strong and it's final, it's period, it's settled, it's done. But no matter how we say it or the faith behind it, God can work with it. You give him what we got. And we often think that we have to have great faith. Sometimes all we got is our broken faith. Don't hold it back from him. Don't say, let me try and figure this out, God. Let me, let me work on my doubt. Give God what you got. God can work with that. He can work with the littlest thing. So when we leave here tonight, there are going to be doubters. There's going to be scoffers. There's going to be negative thoughts. There's going to be bad reports. There's going to be bills. It's going to be there. But we just need to remember that easy statement, but God. And I want to leave you with this before I pray and close us. If he is for us, who can be against us? Man, we got a great God. And I am so thankful for him. And I'm thankful for but God moments. So church, pray with me and, and we'll get you guys out of here. Father God, thank you for your many blessings, Lord. Thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord. Thank you that you choose to walk this life out with us, Lord. Thank you for Jesus and the sacrifice on the cross for us, Lord, that, that we are redeemed, Lord, that we are restored, Lord, that we are saved from sin, Lord. Thank you we are free from those shackles. And so, Lord, no longer will we live in shackles that we put on ourselves, Lord. You've already freed us. You've given it to us. So, Lord, as we leave here today, we're going to remember but God moments. We're going to remember that you are bigger than anything that comes at us, Lord. And so, Lord, we're going to put you at the forefront of everything that we do and know that you have been with us since the beginning, Lord, that you haven't forsaken us, you haven't forgotten us, you haven't left us, Lord, that you are with us each step of the way, Lord. And so, Lord, we're going to stand up against those adversities, those obstacles, those mountains, those things in our life that try to tear us down, that try to take our attention away from you, those storms that, that are raging. And they, yeah, they, they are scary. But you know what? You know what's scarier? A God that loves me. And so, Lord, we put our faith in you, Lord. We'll, we're going to give you as much faith as we can, Lord. And we know that you are going to bring us through it. And so, Lord, as we come up against these opportunities, Lord, that we remember this word that was spoken today, that we remember these but God moments, Lord, and that we remember that you are for us, that nothing can be against us. And we pray for all these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to click on the subscribe button. For more information on Victory Life Church, check us out at victorylifeky.com. Thank you so much for listening.